Alright, fasten your seat belts. We're going to go through seven ways to share your faith. What we're going to talk about is a multi-dimensional approach to witnessing. Where there are many ways you can share your faith, and we're going to learn that people are at different stages of their faith journey. And different forms of witnessing are needed to reach different people. And so it's going to be a win-win situation. Involve more members and it will reach more unbelievers. I want to look quickly at what is evangelism and then why evangelism. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time, how do we do evangelism? All right, and that will be going through the uh, seven ways. The Hebrew word for evangelism is bizarre. It is used 30 times in the Old Testament. Euangelizo is to evangelize. That is used 54 times. That's the Greek word. Then euangelion is the noun. That, that's what gospel is. That appears 75 times. Euangelistes is evangelist. That appears three times. All in all, 162 times in the Bible the word evangelism appears. And do you know what evangelism means? It boils down to this. Proclaiming what kind of news? Good news. Good news. Now, a lot of us are afraid to evangelize because we think, wow, this is scary stuff. And I don't want to share scary stuff with my neighbor or my work associate or my non-Christian spouse or whatever. But really, evangelism is sharing good news. Now, can you think of occasions, occasions, where you would want to pick up the phone and say, guess what? Maybe the birth of a, a baby. Judy and I have a 29-year-old son who's married, been married for three years, and we have a 26-year-old daughter who's been married for three and a half years. We can't wait for the day when we hear on the phone, it's a boy or a girl. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. What about when your favorite football team or soccer team or whatever, they win the Super Bowl? You want to tell everybody, we won! Well, guess what? There's better news than the birth of a baby and your favorite team winning. The best news of all is Jesus has won. Amen. <laughs> he defeated the devil through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension to the Father. He now offers forgiveness, salvation, freedom from sin, and oneness with God. Amen. That is good news, and everybody needs to hear about that. Why do we need to share? We ask, answer the question, what? Evangelism is good news. Why? Why do we need to share that? First of all, for God's sake. 2 Peter 3, 9 says he's not willing to have Many should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you had 12 kids and your house caught on fire, would you be satisfied if uh, just 11 of them made out? You wouldn't be satisfied till every last kid was out of that house. This world is a burning world. It's about to go up in flames. And God wants all of his kids to be safe at home with him. Second. Why well, share the good news for others' sake? Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you remember August 2010, a Chilean mine collapsed? Yes. 33 miners were trapped a half a mile beneath solid rock. And for 69 days, the international community came together and spared no expense. Millions and millions of dollars were spent working night and day. And finally, all 33 of those miners made it out of that shaft. Had something not been done, had something proactive not happened, they would have died. Friends, everyone we know here on planet Earth will die unless we do something proactive. We do it for others' sake. Finally, we do it for our sake. First Corinthians 9, 16 says, Woe be to me! If I do not share the gospel. You alluded to this. You talked about this this morning, Daniel. That I need to share the gospel just as much as they need to hear it. For my own soul's sake. Notice what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Minister of healing. 
page 102. Read this with me off the screen. It is in working to spread the good news of salvation that we are brought near to the Savior. Amen. Ever feel like God is a long way from you? Now, he never moves a long way from us, but sometimes we move a long way from him. How do we get a sense of being close to the Savior? By sharing the good news of salvation. Here's another one. Read this one with me. The Fire of Ages 142. God could have reached his object in saving sinners without our aid, but in order for us to develop a character like Christ, we must share his word. Ellen mm -hmm. White says a lot about character, uh, character transformation. And we cannot develop a character like Christ unless we are sharing in his work. It's essential. Now, here's one more. Desire of Ages 825. The very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. <coughs> to neglect this work is surely to invite what? Spiritual, Spiritual feebleness and decay. Where there is not active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. We have 105 churches plus a number of companies and mission groups in our conference. And I've preached in every one of those 105 churches. And I have seen a lot of our churches that are experiencing feebleness and decay. Most of our churches are not thriving. They're not in overdrive. They're barely in first gear. Many of them are in reverse or back. <laughs> what is the reason that our churches are experiencing feebleness and decay? Right here. We're not partnering with him in his work of saving souls. So do you want to be a thriving church? We must partner with him in his work. All right, the rest of the time we're going to talk about how do we do that. How do we do that? The what of evangelism, the why of evangelism, now the how of evangelism. Different metaphors for witnessing. You ready for this? It's going to flash. You are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're like yeast permeating a dough of bread. You're a fragrance that wafts about. You're like a letter that's read by all. You're like an ambassador of the king of the ages. Now, as I read through these different metaphors that Scripture gives us on how to witness, something jumps out at me. What, what's a golden thread that kind of runs through here? What, what hits you? Salt things that mingle with all the Mingle. All of these have a mingling influence, right? What else? They make a difference. She said that they make a difference. Okay. They make a difference. They all impact what they go into. All right. And evangelism isn't so much a, a, an event. It's a lifestyle. It's not just something we do. It's something we are. You are life. You are ye. You are salt. You may not have to open your flapper at all, but people will notice something different about you. I have people tell me all the time, Pastor, I don't have time to pack evangelism into my already busy schedule. Here's what they're feeling here. My life is in overload. I do not have time for evangelism. But here's what I said. If we are truly salt, light, yeast, then evangelism is at the core of my being. And when I'm working out at the fitness center, I'm doing evangelism. Amen. And when I'm working, Tom, people notice something different about me. And I can talk to my patients about Jesus Christ and the difference he's made in my life. Amen. So whatever we're doing, evangelism just spews out. Amen. All right? So it's not about making time for an event, evangelism. It's just letting your light shine wherever you're at. All right, fishing is another metaphor, but what I want to go to now is gardening. Gardening, three to one over all these other metaphors. Gardening is used over and over. Mark 4 talks about it. Other passages talk about gardening. Witnessing is like gardening. 
just as there are principles in gardening. How many of y'all have garden? Any of y'all have a garden? All right, I'm gonna show you some veggies out of my garden in just a second. But uh, you can't just run your harvest combine out there on the field and expect to reap stuff, right? You first have to break up the ground, you have to sow, there's principles on how to garden. This is my son Matthew, many years ago when he was about two and a half years old. We lived in Pensacola, Florida at the time. His papa, Judy's dad, came from Atlanta and Matt and Dad Bowles made a garden. And the next morning, Matt was up at the crack of dawn. He was up at 5 a.m. and he went running outside. And he came back and said, where's the corn? And where's the beans? And Papa, where's the vegetables? He fully expected for those things to instantaneously appear. It doesn't happen that way, does it? It takes time. It's a process. Let's look at the harvest cycle. The harvest cycle consists of four main stages. Cultivate in the sense of preparing the soil. You've got to break up that soil with the plow. What would happen if you just throw seeds out there in the, the sod? Wouldn't go deep, would it? Wouldn't go anywhere. You have to break up the soil. God has to break up the soil of our hearts before the seed of the word can have any effect. Then you sow the seed. Then the seed germinates, and after eight weeks, ten weeks, whatever, you have the, the corn, the wheat, the tomatoes, whatever it is, and you reap those, and then some of that seed goes into storage or the silo to be thrown into next year's harvest. So it's a continuum. Let me ask you, out of these four stages of evangelism, which stage have we as Adventists historically Emphasize the most. What do you think? Uh, preserve. What? Preserve. All right. What else? What? What do you think we as Adventists have spent most of our time doing? Yeah. Yeah. Reaping. How many of y'all think reaping? All right. Well, how many of y'all think seeds so? though? How many of y'all don't think? <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. That was bad. We as Adventists have traditionally spent a lot of time on reaping meetings, haven't we? We've run the Harvest Combine 24-7 through the field expecting to get souls for the kingdom. But guess what? There is a biblical principle that we've often overlooked. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Uh, Danny, would you read this one off the screen? He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully also reap bountifully. Why is it that so many of our reaping meetings have such little effect? Because we haven't done what first? We haven't seen it Prepared to drink. If you don't sow at all before the reaping meeting, you're probably going to get zip results. And if you sow just a little bit, you'll get a little results. And God says if you sow bountifully, you'll get big results, right? So we have to work the harvest using the principles that God's given us. Now I'm going to look quickly at seven styles of evangelism, seven ways to share your faith with Jesus Christ as we go through these. I want you to be asking yourself, Lord, which of these styles fits me the best? Now it doesn't mean you're off the hook doing all seven. It just means, just like spiritual gifts, operating within the church, to grow the church. God equips us with certain styles that we feel more comfortable with. We're going to go through these quickly. And it starts to cultivate or break up the ground. The first three styles of intercession, friendship, and service primarily break up the ground of people's hearts. You see, people's hearts are lost to the gospel. They don't want to hear it. But if you just pray for them, and if you just be their friend, and if you just serve their needs with acts of kindness, their hearts will be broken and start to open up to consider possibilities. All right, that's the first three. To sow seed, we do that by sharing our testimony. Pastor Daniel, you mentioned about that this morning. 
sharing the good things God has done in your life by inviting people to felt need events and so forth, like this uh, New Start cooking school you all have, and spiritual conversation. That's not giving a Bible study or holding an evangelistic meeting. It's just talking about spiritual things. So that is sowing seeds, and eventually you give that study. You give that prophetic uh, series of meetings, and that's reap. All right, let's go through this quickly. Number one is intercession. Number one is intercession. Praying for the salvation of friends, work associates, so forth. First Timothy chapter two, verses one and four. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? Paul is counseling Timothy. First of all, before anything else, before you give study, before you hold reaping meetings, first of all, I want you to do what? Pray. And if you do that, the net result of that is in verse 4. God will answer those prayers and cause those people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It starts with prayer. Let me share how this verse 4 forcibly into my heart. I was a young intern pastor, just got out of college, hadn't gone to seminary yet, and I was ready to turn the world upside down in Birmingham, Alabama. I was a young upstart preacher, I was going to show everybody how it's done. And I gave a bunch of studies, and I was visiting, and had youth ministry, and pathfinders going, and about six months into this thing called ministry, a lot of activity, no results. One day after I had knocked on a home for three weeks in a row, this lady I was giving studies to, but she failed to show on the, her third Tuesday morning. I drove dejectedly over to the church parking lot. I heard the crunch of gravel under the wheels, and I pulled it under a shade tree and rolled my window down, and I cried. I said, God, what's wrong? I'm putting in a lot of time, nothing's happening. What's wrong? Speak to me, Lord. And I opened my Bible and it fell open to 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. And God said to me, first of all, David, pray. First of all. Well, I felt rebuked. I made out a list of people, youth I was working with, and inactive members, and my Bible study interests, and I saw a miracle begin to take place. Not so much initially out here, but right here. God changed my heart where I was ministering because I loved those people. God gave me a shepherd's heart. And things just began to fall into place. And by the end of the year, there were many baptisms. Prayer is the first thing that we must do. That's the first thing. And uh, there are many references there. Ellen White says, Gospel Worker 65, in times past, there were those who fastened their minds upon one soul after another, saying, Lord, help me to save this soul. But now such instances are what? Rare. Rare. How many act as if they realize the peril of sin? How many take those whom they know to be in peril, presenting them to God in prayer and supplicating him to save them? Here is the 10 most wanted list I came up with, where down the left side, I write the 10 most wanted. Those people that I, I can't stand the thought being in heaven without those people there. And I claim these Bible promises that God will change hearts. Now I have a prayer journal. I've kind of expanded that thing. But the point is, you can put names on napkins, but just write down the names of people God puts on your heart and start praying fervently. That God will save their soul. And guess what? Everything else will fall into place. Amen. God will use you to answer that prayer. All right, the second style of evangelism after praying for people is friendship. How hard is it to be a friend? You know, people are petrified to be on a stage preaching about the, the, uh, four, the four beasts and so forth, but it's not hard to be a friend. It's using natural friendship as an avenue to communicate the gospel in a low-key and non-threatening way. It's the bridge that we reach people. By the way, 
How many of y'all like salespeople that come to the door? Anybody love a, a Stanley salesperson or maybe a, a rainbow vacuum person that comes to the door? I got a vacuum cleaner. You must have. No thanks. Boom. That's my natural reaction. But if you have a friend that has a new Oric vacuum cleaner and says, man, Tom, this vacuum cleaner works like nothing I've ever had. You've got to try this out. You're going to be more apt to check that vacuum cleaner out because you trust that friend. They're not there to sell you a bill of goods, right? So, in order to share the gospel effectively with people, we first need to become their friend to earn the right to share the spiritual truth with them. Amen. I remember when I passed it in Pensacola, Florida, we lived in Lavorde Lane for 12 months renting, and we built a house out in Pace, Florida. We had a little garage sale after living there for 12 months and ready to move into our house, and God rebuked me. People came over from across the street, my neighbors, and I had no clue who they were. I didn't know their names. Didn't have a clue who they were. I was so busy giving Bible studies across town that I didn't even know my neighbors. So I said, God, please change this. And guess what? We got out the pace. We were the fifth home in an eventual neighborhood of about 75 homes. And we developed a Monday night home Bible study. We invited neighbors. We got to know our neighbors, and they came over to the study. None of them were ever baptized, but we're still in touch today, sharing little things, you know. We need to do a better job becoming friends with those around us. Let's read Matthew 11, verse 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collapser, collapser, and sinners, but wine bibber is Don't justified by her children. Praise God. The people were disgusted. The Jewish leaders were disgusted with Jesus. They accused him of being a wine bibber and a tax collector, a friend of sinners. Why did they accuse him of being a friend of sinners? Yes, he was. Why was he? Yeah, he was. He hung out. He hung out with sinners. Now the tendency is. Statistics prove, research proves that usually after three years after someone becomes a Seventh-day Adventist, they totally sever all former friendships with non-Adventists. We need to do a better job being salt and light and maintaining friends. Now, Amen. that doesn't mean you compromise. Jesus never compromised, but he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, right? Notice this statement. Read it with me off the screen. Ministry of Healing 24-25. He, Jesus, accepted their invitation, attended their feasts, made himself familiar with their interests and occupations. Stop there. Made himself familiar with their what? Interests. Interests and occupations. One of the things that will open up people's hearts like no other, walk across the street and say to Richard, Richard, what are your interests and hobbies? What do you like to do, man? Well, I know Richard's a woodworker, and I kind of dabble with a little bit of that, too. You find out a common interest, and really, you like to work wood? Let me come over and see some of your projects. Let's do a project together, right? Jesus was acquainted, familiar with their interests and occupations. Why? That he may gain access to their hearts and reveal to them and perishable riches. There it is. Hearts are naturally locked to the gospel. But when I show an interest in you, Tom, and I want to know, what do you do for a living? What's, what's your interest and hobbies? Tell me about your family. You know, usually we're, we're dishing out the Sabbath, dishing out the day of the dead. We do that, but not right off, right? Tell me about yourself. That opens their hearts up so that they will then ask you questions. 
All right, how do you build a relational bridge? First, you initiate contact. Step across the property line, knock on the door, and just say, hey, I'm your neighbor. Welcome to the neighborhood. Um, get acquainted with them. Start dialoguing with them. Secondly, discover their interests, concerns, and needs. We talked about that. Finally, respond accordingly or appropriately. I remember several years ago, Susan moved in, not across the street, but down at the end of our little dead-end lane. Susan. Uh, Dale Hoover used to live there, but Susan, they moved off to Tullahoma and Susan moved in. I went up there to get acquainted with Susan. Found out that she was a single mother. Her son was about 22. I found out that she had an estranged relationship with her biological mother. Um, then a little while later, she and her mother kind of mended the fence and mom moved in in a trailer behind her house. And I began to realize that Susan had some real needs in her life. I remember the day that uh, she ran over a yellow jacket nest mowing her grass. And I went out there with my gasoline can and killed those yellow jackets. I remember she ran a water line back to the trailer and uh, she needed someone to cover up that line and, and reseed it. And I, I did all that. I remember she expressed an interest in health, shedding a few pounds. And uh, I remember Judy and she struck up friendship and began walking together, working out at the fitness center together. One thing led to another. Uh, I'll come back at the end of the talk and tell you what happened to Susan, all right? But it takes an effort to get to know your neighbors, but Amen. You need to initiate contact, discover interest, and respond to Alright, the third style of evangelism is service. Acts of kindness. Meeting real needs in practical ways opens hearts to God's love. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. That's a little tiny book, it's hard to find, but uh, it's after the Timothy and Titus. Titus 3, verse 14. Someone read that for us. And let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not uh, unfruitful. All right. We need to do good works and meet urgent needs so that we might not be unfruitful. There is a lot packed into that verse. If I care about you with this interested love, and I meet urgent needs in your life, it says that I will be fruitful. If I don't do that, I'm not going to be fruitful. Meeting needs, serving people, opens their hearts up to inquire. Dorcas, remember her? She lived in Java in Acts chapter 9. It says she was full, full of good works and charitable deeds. What did she do specifically in Java? She made little coats and clothing for the people. She didn't preach a single sermon from the pulpit, but she preached a lot of sermons in that town. People opened their hearts up to her. I believe that's why there uh, uh, eventually was a church planted in Joppa because of the good deeds and charitable works of, of Dorcas. Jesus, it said he went about doing good. That's what Acts chapter 10, 38 says. Did Jesus just go from town to town preaching? What kind of doing good did Jesus do going from town to town? He healed. Constantly ministering to me. He took the kids up in his arms. Right? If a little kid stubbed his toe, I see Jesus just, not just put the band-aid on, man. He, he healed that toe. Unbelievable. So we need to learn to do that more. There is a precious story I read about, and I've heard this guy preach. Steve Shogren, for a long time, was pastor of the Vineyard Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. Not an Adventist church. He's written a book on kindness evangelism, Evangelism 101, 101 Ways to Reach Your Community. He lives and breathes 
serving people need. He talks about how he would take brigades of people, let's say there was a big rock concert or a stadium event, he would pass out cold water to the people waiting in line. He actually took brigades and they went through strip halls, going up to the proprietor and said, with that old caddy, we come to clean your commode, your toilet. What? There was one day, they knocked on the door and the little uh, Asian woman at the nail salon, we've come to clean your toilet. And she just stood there aghast. Tears brimmed up in her eyes, filled down her cheeks, and she was speechless. And Steve wondered, what did I do to offend this lady? And, and he said, I'm sorry. And she said, no, it's just that three months ago, my husband passed away. And he was the one that always cleaned the toilets here at the nail salon. And they have not been cleaned in three months. And today, you show up and said, we have come to clean your toilet. Why would you care to do that? Because we want to share the love of Jesus in practical ways. You see, serving needs through simple acts of kindness breaks down barriers. Breaks down barriers. That little lady wanted to find out about their God and their church because they broke down that barrier. We can't just march through our neighborhoods passing out tracts, folks. Yes, we do that, but we've got to pray, be a friend, be real, and serve need. Then people will come and die for our literature, right? All right, uh, notice this. Fourth volume of the Testimonies 227. Read this with me. First, notice what that says. In line of sequence, what is this? First, meet so what? Temporal necessities and relieve their physical wants and sufferings, and you will then find a what? Open avenue to the heart where you may plant the good seeds of virtue and religion. The reason we don't find open avenues to the heart, we get a lot of slammed doors, is because we're first passing out tracks. This says first meet the temporal necessities and then you will find an open avenue to the heart to plant the good seeds of virtue and religion. Amazing. That's, that's oh, like on the soil. If you, if you just throw the seed yes. before preparing the soil, then yeah. there's no result. If you just scatter the seed without preparing the soil, there's no result. Prayer, friendship, and service. I call them the three keys to the heart. You do that first, prepare the ground, then you can scatter the seed. Right? That's the way it works. Oh, oh, we got back up. That's my garden. Praise God. We, we just have about a 10 foot by 15 foot uh, grow box. It, it, I got two by tens in a rectangle with lots of cow manure and good rich dirt and uh, good things happen. There's way too many vegetables for us to utilize in Hartman Home. Now it's just beauty now. So guess where those veggies go? I'm out knocking on doors, Richard and Betty, what would you like today out of our bucket? Uh, Barbara, Jean, what would you like today out of her bucket? Maddie, Danny, what would you like? And it opens up conversation. So good things can happen. I want to just quickly roll through this. A church ought to be more proactive in the community meeting needs. Harlan Church, here's their Adventist Community Center. And uh, see this lady right here? Her name is Sudie Simpson. She's been coming to that community service center for years. This is out in the Appalachia of Eastern Kentucky. And guess what? She now helps operate this center and she comes weekly to the Seventh-day Adventist Church because they first met the temporal necessity. Here is the Raleigh Church, Memphis, and they give free health care for women's shelter. And it's opening up hearts there in the community. This is the former mayor. Since January, a new mayor has stepped in, but A.C. Wharton was the mayor there for a couple terms. 
Three years ago, the pastors, the Adventist pastors in Memphis, we went up together to the seventh floor of the municipal building overlooking the Mississippi River. We walked into this mahogany office and said, Mayor, we're here to find out how we can help you accomplish your dreams and desires for the city of Memphis. Now, what's the normal approach? We come, we come here with our five-day plan. We come here with our, our new start cooking school. How can we help you? And after he picked up himself up off the floor, he uh -huh. said, man, I've never had a church come in and ask me that. Uh -huh. They come with their agenda. One of the things he said, I have a dream of 100 homeless families or poverty families being adopted by local churches. We said, Mayor, by God's grace, we want to do at least five of those. We've helped with all kinds of projects there in the city of Memphis because we went to talk to the mayor first. Here is a uh, Adventist serving Memphis trash pickup day. I'm the guy up here. I picked up more beer bottles on that uh, Sunday morning than I think I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Praise the Lord. But here are these policemen who were who were uh, at either end of the street slowing traffic down, they saw what we were doing. They said, hey, can we get in the picture? Wow. Oh, it yeah. is creating goodwill in the city of Memphis. A million people, people are starting to understand who Adventists are because we're there to serve. Hallelujah. South Louisville Church has adopted Hazelwood Elementary, and they take backpacks, they take ch uh, clothing, you know, Children in elementary school sometimes have accidents. Kindergarten, first, second grade can't hold it and you know mess on themselves. And there's nice clothing there to change into. They've adopted that school. And they have come to know who Adventists are. Christina and Daniel McBeater live in McCrary County, Eastern Kentucky. It is the poorest county in the United States. Christina has some health issues. They couldn't go overseas to be a missionary. They're a missionary here in Kentucky. And after studying the needs, they said, you know, people here don't know how to pick vegetables. They don't know what a vegetable is. And so she started a monthly cooking class just taking maybe uh, taking tomatoes and a number of recipes on how to utilize tomatoes. Another class, spinach. How to utilize recipes with that. She eventually started a vegan, a vegan restaurant, and it's amazing the inroads that have happened. This is Charlene. Charlene is a regular. She has lost about 20 pounds. She's feeling better than she's ever felt in her life. And she is now starting to attend the Stern Seventh-day Adventist Church because they first met their temporal necessity. Amen. Here's Decker Church off of I-24 going towards Chattanooga. Tiny little church. They collect diapers. New packs of diapers for unwed mothers to help them. There's all kinds of things that could be done. The point is we need to do a better job serving our community. Have you ever been to Walmart and only one lane is open and there's like a hundred people trying to get through with all their groceries? We need to open up more service lanes and people will love you more and inquire about what you believe. All right, those first three, we spent a lot of time on those, but those are the three that open the heart. So that now that the heart is open, we cast seed, right? We're going to go quickly through these. The fourth one is testimony. It's simply relaying from your own personal experience what Jesus has done for you. Amen. Remember the demoniac? The pastor talked about it this morning. He used to hang out in the limestone caves, living with the corpses. He broke out of prison repeatedly, shackled dangling from his wrist because he was possessed with a legion of demons. A legion in the Roman army was 6,000 soldiers. There were 6,000 demons that possessed this man. But when Jesus said, be free, he was a new man. Amen. 
And all he had to do was go back home and tell his wife Mary, Mary, I'm a different person. He didn't beat up his wife. He wasn't an alcoholic any longer. Mary saw different. He told about the difference in, in, in his neighborhood. And it's amazing that verse 40 of Luke chapter 8, when Jesus came back to Decapolis, 10 months after he originally yeah. freed this man, the whole region came out to hear what Jesus had to say. Amen. Because of the testimony of one satisfied customer. Unbelievable. Jared Bottle was the poster boy for Subway. Used to be the poster boy for Subway. He, uh, he since, a few months back, he was involved in child pornography and he has been stripped of everything and sitting in a prison right now. But years ago, about 12 years ago, as a junior at Indiana University, he weighed a whopping 425 pounds. He wore 62 inch pants. 62 inch. But now he weighs 190. He lost over 235 in one year by eating low fat Subway sandwiches. Subway found out about him, put him on the payroll. 200 days out of the year, he was telling his story in middle school. He was before cameras, shooting uh, over 30 advertisements for uh, the industry, helping them to pr promote their product. product. And because of the testimony of one satisfied customer, Subway is the fastest growing franchise today. About four years ago, they outpassed McDonald's as having more franchises. Ooh, wow. Let me ask you something. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? How yes. many of you have tasted and seen that Amen. Jesus is good? Are you telling other people about it? We've got to tell other people our testimony. Here's Desire Basin 347. Read this with me. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old, but that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works the salvation of souls. You put it so well this morning, Daniel. You don't have to have a theology degree. You don't have to know he Greek and Hebrew. All you have to do is know Jesus and tell what he has done in your life. And I tell you, to hear a little child stand up and share their love for Jesus, to hear a, a housewife or a business person or a doctor or whoever it may be share what Jesus means to me, that's going to break down barriers. People are going to listen. People are going to want that same peace, that same hope that you have found. And we've got to do a better job at that. All right, fifthly is the style of invitation. It's simply inviting family, friends, and acquaintances to socials, felt need seminars like your, your uh, new start, or events where Jesus and the gospel truth are introduced. A church ought to have a plethora of social, volleyball, uh, hayrides, bonfires, uh, whatever, excuses for you to invite them to come. There are many non-Christians who would gladly come to a worship service, small group, or outreach event if they were just invited. Alright, there's several examples of this. Andrew invited his brother Peter to meet Jesus. Philip invited his friend Nathaniel. Remember the Samaritan woman? She met Jesus at the well. She came to get water. She left with the living water. And she went back to the village and told the man who she plied a trade with, come and see a man who's changed my life. And uh, so she invited them to come. Now, Tom Rainer is now the president, CEO of Life uh, the Baptist Spokehouse, Lifeway. And he has done research in his unchurched next door. Eight out of ten people that were surveyed unchurched said they would gladly come to church if they received an invitation. 
But sadly, only 2% of church members are giving invitations. That's the sin of silence, he calls it. The sin of silence. We need to do a better job of inviting people. Let me just tell you about a couple things that uh, when I was pastor of Highland Church, we had an annual Thanksgiving banquet, and about 550 people would come, packed out family life there. Oh. Most of them were not happy. We had an annual mulligan stew where you have a bonfire and you have this big cauldron of chili and you have a big cauldron of vegetable stew. And the, the broth is in there. People come and bring their cut of veggies. And while the stuff is cooking up, you're out on a, a hayride. You're out flipping the frisbee. And uh, so many people come out today. Don't forget about the donuts. What's that? The, the donuts. donuts. <laughs> Jim and Alexander Lisbeth, donuts. People would come for miles just to get the donuts. That's exactly right. All right, the sixth style of evangelism, again, the testimony, the invitation, and the conversation sows the seed. This uses dialogue to introduce people to Jesus and his truth. It's more interactive, inquiring, Socratic in nature. Socrates was an interesting philosopher. The way he gained a following was not by preaching. He asked Krogan questions. He drew people out. And so in this spiritual conversation, you're not so much beating people with doctrine. You're asking, well, what do you believe about? What brings meaning and fulfillment into your life? Let me hear your story. They'll reciprocate and ask you about your story. Uh, Paul was a good example of this. You read in Acts chapter 17, verse 2, and onward, repeatedly it says he went into the synagogue and reasoned with them from the scriptures. That word in the original Greek is dialegamon. Dialegamon. What does that sound like? Dialogue. Dialogue. He just struck up a conversation. It says that he went to the marketplace and reasoned with them. He just got in a dialogue with them. He went to the school of Tyranium, the public university, and dialogued with the students. There's a different flavor about just getting in a conversation. And here is uh, what I alluded to a moment ago. You can ask, uh, Daniel, I'm just curious. Uh, what do you believe about what happens when a person dies? What's your understanding about that? Oh, they go straight to heaven, preacher. Well, why do you believe that? And what difference does that make in your life? Usually, they don't know why they believe it. They don't have a chapter and verse. There is no chapter and verse that says you go immediately to heaven. Uh, what difference does that make in your life? And then usually they will say, well, David, what do you believe about? So then I can just share a verse or two. Well, 1 Thessalonians 4 says people sleep. And on the resurrection morning, the archangel's going to wake them up with his voice. So uh, another thing is, what brings meaning and fulfillment to your life? And they'll reciprocate and ask you. Get, get in the dialogue. I'm sure in your Muslim ministry, Danny, you're doing a lot of just conversation, dialoguing. And uh, they will start asking deep questions. By the way, my wife is a public school teacher. She taught for many years in the Adventist school system. She says she sits in the teacher's lounge and people talk about Friday night football games. They talk about getting their, their hair and their nails done. And she says, David, it's so frustrating. How do I bring that conversation around the spiritual thing? And you can't propagate any kind of religion in the classroom. That's a no-no. The ACLU will dance all over that. They made her take down an amazing fact calendar with nature pictures because it has a little tiny verse on the bottom. But here is something that's helpful. R. I. Colin 301, when you get into a conversation with unbelievers, do not talk of nothingness and folly, but tell the precious things of God. Amen. Study how to pass easily and courteously from subjects of a temporal nature to the spiritual and eternal while walking by the way or seated by the wayside. You may drop into some part of the seat of truth. It takes prayer. And I tell you, I went into, uh, I, I was in a restaurant, Judy's out of town, 
So I was in a restaurant Friday. I don't like to cook. And I prayed when I was in there. I said, Lord, if there's someone here I need to talk to, please use me. And uh, found out that the, the waiter is about to go into the military. And we got talking about that a little bit. And, uh, and I shared with him a promise, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. The Lord has uh, a bright future and a hope for you is the idea. And uh, anyway, I just think that as if we pray, God help me to steer this conversation in more spiritual channels. He's going to bring that about. All right, the last one is reaping. After you have broken the ground through prayer, friendship, and service, after you've thrown the seed out through uh, sharing your testimony and inviting them to felt need events and, and spiritual conversation, then finally, hallelujah, you ought to be proclaiming the three angels' message, the gospel. This is the final style, declaring the absolute truth of God's word in an authoritative Matter of fact way, it includes both teaching and preaching. Uh, Peter's an example of this. At Pentecost, he stood up and preached, didn't he? And how many responded? 3,000. That's right. Uh, in several places in the Bible, in the book of Acts, it says the disciples proclaimed the word publicly and from out to out, both the public proclamation of the word and Bible studies in people's houses. And there's all kinds of ways of doing this. I like to share this, that uh, we're coming down to the end where everybody on planet Earth will either choose life or death. They will either follow the beast or they will follow the lamb. There's a line of demarcation drawn in the sand. And the last call to go to planet Earth is the three angels' message. And that is a call that mentions the gospel. It includes trusting in the righteousness of Christ, the judgment, glorifying God in character and lifestyle, worshiping the Creator on the Sabbath, coming out of Babylon, avoiding the mark of the beast, hellfire, keeping God's commandments, and the truth about soul sleep and the soon coming of Jesus. It is a comprehensive, distinctive message. And if we don't declare this message, the rocks are going to cry out. The Baptists, the Methodists, beautiful people, but they are not declaring a holistic gospel that prepares people for the soon coming of Jesus. And folks, we need to internalize this message and share this message in a distinctive way. Great Controversy 612 says this. Read this with us. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit. Look, you know why so many of us are afraid to get out there? Because we are afraid we don't know this message well enough. And they're going to stump us with some question. But this will not find its way to the heart so much by argument but by the what? The deep conviction. I really believe that this world is about to come to a conclusion. And there are so many people that need to know this distinctive message. And we need to be sharing the thunder in the Holy Land or Bible tracts or, or Bible lessons or live streaming our services, whatever. There's so many ways that we need to be getting our message out there. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. Amen. I believe the greatest days for Adventist evangelism are still ahead. Amen. All this seed sowing that we've been doing for 160 some years 
it's about to come to a cataclysmic conclusion. Ellen White talks about fireballs coming out of heaven and destroying our big city, Nashville being one of them. What are we doing to warn the city? What are we doing to warn our town? We've got, we've got to be part of this. And don't be afraid to involve the youth, the children. Man, how can a grumpy old guy answer the door and turn a child away? They're going to listen to what a child has to say. In her chapter in the Great Controversy on the Reformation, she talks about the children preaching. It's amazing. All right, I have a question for you as we bring this plane down towards the conclusion. Which is more important? We've talked about the cultivating, the sowing, and the reaping through these various means. The first six are primarily relational evangelism. The last one is proclamational. Which is more important, the relational evangelism or the proclamational evangelism? How many say relational? How many say proclamational? How many say both? Yeah, that's the thing. It's both. It's like a two-winged bird. Can a bird fly with one wing? No. No. You know, for so long, we have been wrong in Seventh day Adventists to just go out and do public meetings without first breaking the ground, building friendships, serving needs, We've been wrong doing that. We've gotten a, a uh, you know, less and less result. But the other extreme is there are people that have thrown the baby out with the bathwater and say evangelism doesn't work anymore. And they want to just join the friendship evangelism wagon with the evangelical. That's wrong too. We have to have <laughs> relational evangelism and proclamational evangelism. Amen. And God will win our all right. Would you give me ten more minutes? Yes, sir. I want to do one more thing. Stand up a second. Stand up. Roll your shoulders. Roll your shoulders both ways. Roll your head around. Both ways. There you go. Turn to your neighbor and smile and tell them God loves you. All right. Hey, now, I saw a kiss back here. <laughs> I hope that's more than just the hate. All right. All right, everybody sit down. All right, this is exciting. This is going to tie this whole thing together. You ready? Yes, sir. We have been looking at different styles of evangelism. And everybody in the church can do one of these styles. Everybody. We're all needed. We're about to learn that there are different stages of people's faith. And different styles will mesh with different stages to reach people where they're at. All right, you remember this parable Jesus told in Mark chapter 4? He said, a farmer went out to sow seed. The seed is the word of God. It's the eternal riches in God's word. And some of that seed fell on the hard ground. It never penetrated the heart. Other seed fell on stony ground and thorny ground, finally fertile ground. And interestingly, that the riper, the more open the soil is the more effective that seed can be, all right? So it illustrates that there are different stages of faith. Some people are very close to the gospel. Other people are very receptive. I'm ready, all right? Let's probe into this a little more. Different types of hearing. Here is the angle scale, we call it. It starts with the negative five. And the cross is conversion, when they accept Jesus and become a Christian. There are some people 
that are way out here at negative five, they're antagonistic to Christianity, especially Adventist Christianity. Others move a notch closer and they're resistant. Others are indifferent. Others are receptive. And finally, seek it. Dish it out, I'm ready. Depending on where a person is in their pathway of faith, we witness to them accordingly. If someone is way out here on the antagonistic side, do you give them a handbill to a revelation seminar? You can, but they're probably not going to do much with it. Probably go to minus six. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like to use the door metaphor. The antagonistic, that door is shut, it is locked, it is barred, it is double busted. Leave me alone. Right? The resistant, it's just a little crack. The indifferent, a little further open. Then the receptive and the seeking, buddy, that door is wide open. You have to discern where a person's at. It's kind of like the red light, green light principle. I'd say if people are giving you a red light, stop. Stop. Jesus knocks on the door of our heart. Does he barge in with his bulldozer? He respects. He respects that door. And if he respects, I have to respect. If someone's giving you a locked door, don't bulldoze through the door. There's going to be two people hurt. But if someone's giving you a yellow light, proceed with caution. If you got a green light, jump on the gas. Let's go for it. You discern where people are at and minister accordingly. Here is what Ellen White says, and we're going to see her quote in a second. But a doctor that comes in and hears a patient, does he say, uh, Danny, the guy that was sitting here just before you had a sinus infection and I prescribed a letter with. So that's going to do for you too, man. Here you go. See you later. Is that what a doctor does? Does he prescribe the same exact medication for everybody that comes into his office? No. He checks them over. He does an examination and then treats them accordingly. You see? And this is what Ellen White says, so insightful, from reviewing here on March 11, 1902. The ministers of Jesus Christ, that's not just Danny and I, it's all of us, will have more than a mere casual interest for the people that will seek to know the state of their spiritual being, even as a physician seeks to understand the physical difficulties of his patients. They will engage in personal conversation and do what? Adapt. Adapt their counsel to every individual case according to the what? The need, the need of the soul. Interesting. We need to be more attuned to this. Different methods must be followed in deal, dealing with different people. Here's what's fascinating. I went to, uh, got a doctor of ministry in church growth and evangelism and wrote a whole dissertation on this very thing. But basically, people are at different stages and it's estimated it takes 20 to 30 nudges to move a person from antagonistic to seeking. 20 to 30 gospel nudges. Just be an instrument of God that makes one of those nudges. Now, I believe it is just as important in the heart of God to be the first nut, just through some smile or act of kindness, to move them from antagonistic to resistance, as it is that last nudge that nudges them into the baptistry. It is just as important in the heart of God because had this number one nudge not happened, the number 30 nudge would have never happened. You see that? So don't be discouraged if that friend that you're witnessing to doesn't immediately get in the baptistry. God is at work. God is at work, and it takes all of us working together. We've looked at three key concepts. We started with the multi-flame torch. 
There are seven ways to share your faith in Christ. Friendship, service, so forth. We've also looked at the, uh, the harvest cycle, the cultivating, sowing, reaping, preserving. We've also looked at the angle scale. I prayed that God would give me a tool to put all this together. I wrote this 210-page dissertation. I said, God, this is too much. I want something simple that says it on one page. And God gave me this. Isn't this cool? I call it the witnessing wheel. Inside the purple, this is your circles of influence, starting in the core with your own family. Do any of you have family members that are not Christian or Adventist? Mm -hmm. I do. And sometimes that's the most frustrating, to witness to your own family, because they know you warts and all. How dare you share Jesus with me when you got your own problems, right? <laughs> Whatever. It goes on to friends and neighbors, colleagues, acquaintances, Person X is the random person you meet at the checkout counter at Walmart. All right, that's your circle of influence. Then the next ring, the blue ring, is the angle scale. Everybody in your circle of influence, ask yourself, where is this person on their, in their faith stage? Are they a negative five, antagonistic, or are they a negative one, seeking? I have a neighbor. Bill Bradley, who lives at the end of my country lane, he is definitely a negative four or five. He has, he's 92 years old. He's a tough old geezer. He has probably only been to church maybe once in his life at the death of his wife. Wouldn't dare step inside a church. How do I witness to Bill Bradley? Well, corresponding to where he's at, I need to primarily be what? Cultivate. That's what's going to speak to Bill Bradley. How do I cultivate? Very good. Praying for him, being his friend, and serving me. You see that? So, once in a while, I go up, Bill, how you doing? Uh, I just chat. Uh, we'll go up there at Christmas time and sing Christmas carols. Take him a little fruit, uh, nut, loaf of bread with a little step to Christ. He ended up in the hospital. He had uh, a heart attack, and then he broke his hip down at Sumner Regional. And I went down and prayed with him. Now, I knew I could get away with it, because when a person's in the hospital, they usually are looking <laughs> for the Lord. I prayed with him. Bill is up here in the negative five, and that's the way I witnessed to him. Witness where he's at. All right? Susan, my next door neighbor, she's moved about two years ago, but Susan's probably down here. I just met her practical needs. We got acquainted with her. Judy walked with her, went out to the fitness center with her. Uh, after a while, Susan, I, I was invited to church. Susan, you want to come to church? No, not ready for that. Her mother wanted to come. We began toting her to church. It gave her a morning off to go shopping. All right, that's all right. You know, meet them where they're at. But finally, Susan, we, we invited her over to the house to eat with us on Sabbath. She wouldn't come to church, but we had her over Sabbath lunch and went to walking at Bledsoe Creek State Park to show her how we find joy in Sabbath keeping. And after a while, she said, you know, how come you never cut your grass on Sabbath? You always do it on Thursday or Friday. And I began to share about that in little bits and pieces. Eventually, Eventually, Susan made a monumental decision. I'll share about that in just a second. Uh, but you discern where they're at, meet their needs accordingly. If you're getting ready for evangelistic meetings, you gotta do a lot of seed sowing first. You gotta use the three keys to the heart that'll provide, create an open avenue to the heart. Two quick stories and I'll close. Matthew, between his junior and senior year at Southern, he didn't know what he was going to do in life. Teacher, preacher, doctor. He went down to Peru for a year as a student missionary. And while he was there for a whole year, he learned Spanish. And he taught at the 
primary school. He taught them English. He worked in a little jungle clinic. He also gave some Bible studies. And after about five months just ministering to practical needs, meeting their temporal necessities, they had an evangelistic series, and 34 people were baptized. They planted a church there in the jungles, the headwaters of the Amazon River in the Gulf of Peru. They planted a church because they first used the three keys. All right, well, it happened here. This is Highland Church, where I pastored for 12 years. Many of you have been there. Back in 2008, we had an evangelistic series with Jason Slider from Amazing Facts. And I said to myself, for too long, we've done this the wrong way. We've just gone out and done meetings, let the handbills do the work. And nine months before that meeting, we hammered friendship, getting to know your neighbors, pray through your 10 most Mondays. Share your testimony, all those things. And this was exciting to see what happened. At the end of that series, 20 people were baptized, 16 of them because island members had first been using the three keys to the heart. Amazing. Only four came off the street. Here is uh, TJ. TJ is a piano salesman, lives up at the end of Brown's Lane. Hallie and Peggy Glass were neighbors of theirs, had a strawberry patch, began sharing strawberries with TJ and his mother and in, uh, uh, invalid mother and brother. TJ was hooked. The stomach is the pathway to a man's heart. Come on now. Come on. He was hooked. Then it was DVDs and other things that eventually TJ was invited to the meetings and he became baptized. Here is uh, Jerry and Dewanda, you all know him, that have been to Highland. They live out in Bethpage, and they have a neighbor by the name of Frank Webb. You all know Frank Webb? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Frank is an American Airlines pilot, busy, flying out of the, the, the hub there at Dallas Fort Worth. And Frank said, I got to do a better job getting to know my neighbors. He went across the street, got to know DeWanda and Jerry, had them over Saturday night for popcorn and games. One thing led to another. DeWanda and Jerry came to the Adventist church during the meeting, were baptized the day they're Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Here is Susan, our next door neighbor. After three years of patiently using the keys, <laughs> Susan began to ask questions. She came to the meeting and was baptized. You know what? 16 of these 20 people would have never been baptized had the Highland members not first been using those keys to the heart. Does it work? Yes, it works. Praise God. I want to close with this. As you consider the seven styles of evangelism, as you consider the people around you and where they're at in their faith journey, how would God use you? I don't know how he's going to use you. I struggle with this every day. I am selfish, I'm sinful, I'm preoccupied, and I have a thousand other things on my radar. But every day I pray, Lord, please flush me of self. Fill me with you. Use me to witness to at least one person today. If not what we are or what we can do, it's what God can do through humble instruments, if we will just that. And this final slide, I'd like for us to uh, make a prayer circle. I'd like to make a prayer circle. And uh, I would like to, let's do that. Let's get... Make a big ring around this. And let's hold hands and uh, can we kneel and stay in our circle? We'll see. If you if if you just can't get down and back up, stay standing. That's all right. But uh, I would like to read this statement real quick. Let's read it together. There is no limit to the usefulness of water 
who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. Do you believe that? There's no limit to what God can do through you in your little circle of influence if you just say, here I am, God. Take me, bless me, use me. All right, let's bow our heads. Uh, let's kneel.